and it's been a it's been a, been a joy the entire process. Okay, so I'll start here. I've got some information on different Paranda traditions traditions around the Caribbean. So first, let me. I would like to thank Cheryl and Ronnie for organizing this, and for Gafu in general for their work in the community uh, here in Los Angeles and in other places as well to preserve and maintain Garifuna culture. It's very very important. I also would like to thank Mercedes Douglas here uh, at uh, UCLA for providing the space for us to have this uh, and record the Paranda workshop. So, as you see on the map here, or in the first slide here, I wanted to create something that would give an idea of uh, the cultures that we'll talk about. From the Garifuna, the principal main focus, to Trinidad uh, and Tobago, and also here on, the, on this side is the flag of Venezuela, and we also have Puerto Rico there. Okay. So those are some of the traditions that we'll talk about today, and I'll move through this quickly so we can uh, get on to uh, Mr. Asiatic. Okay, so the purpose of what we are, why we are here, and some things for the, that I wanted to discover and dis, to, dis, to discuss during this presentation, and that is first, the purpose to identify the musical and cultural traditions that share the name Paranda, or Paranda, in the Caribbean region. So we want to look at that. To know similarities and differences in social and cultural functions in these traditions. So we look at how these traditions are similar and how they're different. Also to note differences and similarities in how the music is performed. That's what we also want to look. And to explore the Garifana Paranda and to reveal why it's unique as a form of male social commentary and that which is accepted by the entire culture as a form of identity or a way of expressing identity. So our cultures that we'll talk about today, Puerto Rico, of course, Venezuela, Trinidad and Tobago, and the Garifuna culture as expressed, of course, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, and here in the Garifuna diaspora, including Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, and other places. So, when we look at the map of the Caribbean, I wanted to include this because this encompasses the entire region of what we'll, we'll be talking about today. Starting here in Puerto Rico, from the Paranda tradition there, then going into Venezuela, here, uh, in the areas near Caracas, and an area, uh, Guatire, which is close, not far from uh, Caracas, and then into Trinidad and Tobago, and then, of course, into Central America, where we have the Garifuna and the four countries we mentioned before. Okay? Now, let's start with Puerto Rico. We see a map here. And we'll be looking at traditions as it is done, as it's performed today, and as it's traditionally been performed, the paranda in these particular areas. Now you see the name Boriquen, uh, Boriquen, uh, Boriquen. This is, this is the Taino word for Puerto Rico, for the country. Okay, and this is what the what they came, and it means the land of the valiant lord. Yeah. Okay. Now the parandas are festive holiday celebrations in which carolers, carolers travel from house to house singing aguinaldos. And these aguinaldos really are a form of Christmas carols and they come from the people who live in the countryside called the hibaro. Uh, this is hibaro music. That they travel from house to house and they beg for pasteles or tamales and co uh, coquitos, uh, which is, which is spice, spiced eggnog, or uh, rum spice eggnog. Now the carolers, they typically get larger as they go from one community to the next, or one house to the next. As they go in, they dance, they sing, uh, the people there feed them a little bit, then they go on to the next house. Does this sound familiar within Garifuna culture? And, uh, yes, because we have this in Wanaragua, as, as it is done. Okay. So the, now the roots of uh, Boricuan, a Puerto Rican culture, are based on Taino, uh, Spanish, and West African traditions. Now, this period of celebration that they have is, goes not just during Christmas time, but it extends actually into January as well, and actually into mid-January. But the principal days are Noche Buena, which is, of course, Christmas Eve, Navidad, Christmas, Despida de Año, which is New Year's Eve, of course, and El Dia de Reyes. Now, this particular day, January 6th, also important, again, because it is Three Kings Day, and it's very 
important in Belize as well and in uh, Guatemala and Honduras as the day in which the children participate oftentimes in Guanaragua. Okay. Okay. Now, Christmas in Puerto Rico. Um, you have aguinaldos, which are Christmas carols themselves. They sing also what is a, a music form called decimas, which are ten line stanzas of poetry that is, that is uh, transformed into song made of ten lines. And then you have the, in many cases, the, the Puerto Ricans represent, uh, they dress up, and then they used to do this many years ago, but uh, now in most of the videos that I've seen, they don't wear the country apparel that they used to. So they represent the people who will come from the countryside in to the cities, and they would have the straw hats and various other things. Of course, nowadays, instead of the straw hats, baseball caps and various other things, so contemporary culture has uh, prevailed in that case. Okay, so also, some of the instruments that you will find here, we have the um, guitarras, tamboriles, which is the skin drums, of course, the guiro. Now, which are the metal scrapers and also the gourd, here, the guiros, you have two types. This is made of gourd, and you also have one of metal. And you have the maracas, of course, and the palitos. Now, the palitos are two, uh, they said this is probably the oldest of the instruments, and these are just the two sticks here that are struck together. Of course, this is related to the clave, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's what you'll have. So when we look at this particular picture here, this is what you will find in Puerto Rico, but you will also find especially the maracas and the guiro, some form of, of guiro, plus a string instrument in all most all of the Pananda traditions, especially Venezuela, Trinidad, and here in Puerto Rico. Okay. Now, I want to I want to show you this particular uh, painting that is from a site called El, Buri El Boricua and the Puerto Rican, and they have information on the site about paranda and about other uh, cultural practices associated with Puerto Rico. And this is a painting of how it may have been at some point, how it was in the past, when people would go with the straw hats from house to house. You see the cuatro here, and you'll find people drinking here, going inside the home, surprising them at night is what they would oftentimes do. And the purpose here is to go and to um, go with your friends to one particular home. You will sing, you will wait, and then you will uh, start the music to wake to awaken the person, go in, sing for a little bit, go inside, and that is when you get refreshments. You do this for, for a while, and then you go to the next house, and then, and then ends about, until, and goes on until dawn. Now, most of the times, the people are not really surprised because you, they give signals to them during the course of the week. You know, somebody may be coming by your house or sort of something along this line to let them know that this particular thing will happen at the, at the home. So they give them hints throughout the, throughout, the, throughout the week that this will happen. Now, this continues for some time, as I mentioned to you, and they go from one house to the house to, uh, to another in the, in the given neighborhood. Now, the group grows in size as this occurs, and they continue on. On, as I mentioned at dawn and when they get to the last house that's when they are given chicken soup and other local dishes to eat okay so let's look at an example here of a group arriving at one particular house uh, and this is in Paranda 2013 in Puerto Rico <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So I wanted to give you an example of what that sounds like, of what you would do if you participated in Paranda in Puerto Rico. Now let's look at another song here, and this is called De la Montana, De la Montaña Venimos, okay? And in this particular case, it is from the mountains. Uh, we come to invite you to eat a uh, roasted pig. They, uh, the tradition is they'll have a pig on a stick that they'll roast, a small pig. A uh, roasted pig on a stick, homemade rum, as we found out yesterday, moonshine, uh, the homemade rum uh, to drink. And it says, ah, Lady Maria, ah, compadre Jose, open the door so I can, so I can see them. Open, open the door, friend. It is already three in the morning and I have not yet had a drop of coffee. So, they're going from house to house, and this is what happens. Now, Paranda songs are usually more secular than they are religious, and although some of the traditions of the, of the Aguinaldo maintain, sometimes they maintain the spirit of the season. So sometimes they do have this references to Christmas and things. Okay, so that is Puerto Rico. We'll go on to Venezuela now. So we see the map here. I want to show you the map because I wanted, to give, give, wanted you to have an idea of where this particular, uh, some of the events occur. Around the Cayacas area, and then Guari, Guatire, we'll talk about in just a moment, is another type of Paranda tradition that occurs, uh, it's in this particular region here, um, not far from Caracas. Again, you have these musicians that go from house to house. Again, they use the term aguinaldos, and these are carols, Christmas carols. And they will sing these as they go. Sometimes they can be secular, sometimes they can be sacred, okay? And the song, the word itself, aguinaldo, means Christmas carol, okay? And the ensemble, let's think about this, the same type of music that we had before. And this would be singers. You have a cuatro, uh, which is a small guitar-like instrument, of course. You have uh, maracas and the charasca, uh, metal gourd scraper. So whether it's this, uh, by the name of guiro or charasca, you will have these type of instruments that you will find just like you did in Puerto Rico. Okay? You also have a friction drum that's called furuco. Uh, furuko for a friction drum. Okay. So let's look, look at some of the other characteristics here. So in neighboring Trinidad, many of people who lived in Venezuela are close to, is very, very close to Trinidad. As we know, Trinidad is the southernmost island in the Lesser Antilles, the smaller islands in the lower chain there, of course, of the Caribbean islands here. It's, it's the last one before you get to South America. And it is very, very close to, to Venezuela. So a lot of Venezuelans migrate and live in Trinidad, or have lived there for many, many years. So they have brought the tradition over to Trinidad where it is called Parang. And we'll talk about that just in just a moment. But also, so the Aguinaldos or the Christmas carols, we mentioned some of the instruments, that many of them are the same that you will find in Puerto Rico. Okay. So I want to play a, another example for you, and this is of a song called Un, uh, 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 Viva el Parandon. should be an in there, Viva el, uh, el Parandon. And this particular translation, oh, let me go. it says the Paranda, which is the festivity of the party, the group of people has a, uh, have arrived. The party has begun. Open the door. Open the front gate. Let's toast with liquors, food, and the warmth of your company. And the party is at its height, filling the air with the smell of Christmas. Christmas carolers sing with happy voices, and they sing at the at, they sing their best. So this is what this uh, the translation. Now the group that is going to perform uh, now un solo pueblo, one one um, one people, and this particular group is uh, quite quite um, well known. It's a Venezuelan musical group that was formed in 1976. And the performers primarily focus on paranda and other forms of traditional forms of music. One People, the name of the group, is the most widely known and celebrated of these groups in the country. And they have really had a major role in preserving the traditional music in Venezuela and promoting this throughout the country, especially Afro-Venezuelan music. So let's listen to their version uh, of, a, of the song that we just, uh, the uh, Viva el Parandon. Llegó la parranda, llegó el parandón, 
Llegó la parranda, llegó el parrandón Abranos la puerta, abran el portón Brindemos licores, comida y calor Brindemos licores, comida y calor Ya revienta la parranda Perfumando el aire de la Navidad Cantan los arriesgueros Con voces alegres su mejor cantar Cantan los arriesgueros Con voces alegres su mejor cantar Y empecé un humilde nació el niño Dios Y empecé un humilde nació el niño Dios Celebremos todos con gozo y amor El sueño de un año, la fiesta del sol El sueño de un año, la fiesta del sol Ya revienta la parranda Perfumando el aire de la Navidad Cantan los aguinaldeos Con voz de So, I want to tell you about another paranda tradition that occurs that's not associated with Christmas, but it involves people in a procession of, of, of singers, of carolers. And this is known, this is a big event that is held in the Guarenas Guatire Valley, which is um, in this particular area in Paranda de San Pedro, occurs on June the 29th in the city of Guatire. And basically the procession and dancing of this, of, this, uh, of this fiesta is accompanied by the cuatro again, maracas, similar again, and foot stomping and singing. Now the characters, they reenact the story. Uh, and this goes back to colonial days. They blacken their faces, okay? And to represent their African, to represent African ancestors. The characters include, and all of the characters, are dre all of them are men in, in some cases, whether they're playing uh, women's roles or not, they dress uh, as, uh, in the costume as all male, all men that participate. One is called Maria Ignacia, a man dressed as a woman, of course. In this case, you also have one who carries uh, and dances with the statue of St. Peter. You have a flag bearer. You have two boys uh, who dance next to Maria Ignacia and two dancers uh, with, the, with squ large squares of thick uh, leather and that they use as a stomping to, to stamp, to make sound when they stamp on the ground. So let's take a look at this. It's very interesting, the uh, Paranda tradition in San Pedro. La sentencia albergada en la garganta pasa de murmullo a canto. La historia se repite anualmente para sostener un culto y una festividad surgidos en algún momento a finales de la colonia y cuyos símbolos principales son San Pedro y la Parranda. A pesar de las búsquedas efectuadas por colectividades y entes del Estado venezolano, no es posible asignar fecha precisa al milagro y al inicio de la parranda de San Pedro, originaria de las poblaciones de Guarenas y Guatire, que conformaban una sola zona en el hoy central Estado Miranda, en Venezuela. Eso sí, San Pedro cuenta con la tradición oral. San Pedro es todo. San Pedro es Guatire, San Pedro es Guarena. San Pedro es cada uno de aquellos que prenden una vela el 29 a las 6 de la mañana y salen de su casa. Es todo. El personaje principal es María Ignacia. Ya sabemos ya que María Ignacia es la promesa que, que hizo con su hija Rosa Ignacia. Y en esa época parece que el, eso fue cogiendo mucho auge la promesa de María, de María Gracia y los compañeros de ella la acompañaban también a la, a la iglesia y ella bailaba y cantaba su San Pedro su, rústicamente ¿no? y los amos le dieron el día de asueto a todos los, a todos los esclavos de esa familia de las negras ellos eran libres, ese día era libre se enfermó María después del milagro Y en su lecho de muerte, de su enfermedad, le pide a su esposo que continuara con la promesa que ella le hizo al santo. 
there. But it's a really interesting tradition and fascinating tradition that they have there. Okay, let's go into Trinidad and Tobago. Now, uh, as I mentioned to you before, the whole process or the tradition in Trinidad was introduced by the Venezuelans who moved there or who migrated there. And it is uh, it's a popular folk music tradition that is it was introduced, as I mentioned you, by Venezuelan immigrants. Uh, many of the immigrants uh, were Amerindian, Spanish, and African heritage, and their ethnicity is emphasized in their music. So the term parang, the term parang itself means a spree or a fete, a party, and it, they believe it comes from two particular terms, uh, paranda meaning that, or parar, to stop. Okay, past performance practices. Uh, in the past, they would the, they would visit the homes and the families like they do in Venezuela, like they do in in Puerto Rico, with their singing. Popular today in several particular places, and I'm going to go back to the map because I want to show you some of the places that it's popular. You find my little. Here we go. Uh, in this particular area, Marava, you find the paranda perform parang performed there. Uh, Le Pinois here and in the area right above Arima, which is a very important cultural place as well. Okay. Now, we also mentioned the Aguinaldo, or simply Christmas carols, and they relate to the story of the nativity uh, in many cases. And um, they travel from traditionally, as the traditional carolers do, from house to house. And this is still practiced in some cases, but now they have expanded this to include national competitions. National competitions where you have entire parang groups that will perform. And here are some of the, uh, the dishes that you'll have. Pastille, pastille, uh, sorrel, most of you have had sorrel before, rum and punchy crema. The spiked eggnog like they have in Puerto Rico as well. So these traditions, Although these are in various locations, but there's a good pr distance between Puerto Rico and, and Trinidad, uh, and the, the similarity of the traditions in these three, three, these three places is very, very interesting. So we talked about some of the instruments. Notice the same instruments that you just saw from Venezuela, the, the cuatro, maracas, uh, and also, in many cases, the claves, the two, uh, the two sticks, here we, and also some cases. Now, they are, include here other string instruments, uh, violin, in addition to the guitar. This would be in Trinidad now, okay? So I want to intru introduce you to and show you two particular performers and then a, then a group that will perform. The next performer here is Alexandra Daisy Voisin, who is really a living legend in, in, um, in Trinidad. And she was, died in, two th and, uh, I think, 2011, let me get this, no, uh, 1991, sorry, 1924 to 1991. And this is her performing. Everyone in Trinidad knows her as an important parang singer. Oops. So I want to move on to two other people uh, performing Scrunter. And most of you, some of you know Scrunter, if you know uh, soca music. Yeah. Now Ronnie mentioned yesterday that he, he knew him, uh, or at least knows of his music and everything. He's very popular in Trinidad, a, so a parang artist and a soca, uh, a soca artist as well. And the song that he's going to, to sing now is something probably you've, some of you may, may have heard, at least the phrase is a popular song done, done at Christmas, Christmas time, I want a piece of pork. Okay. <laughs> Christmas song keep playing, but I'm group getting in line. I hope Santa bring me. 
So when they take traditional parang and they mix it with soca, it's soca parang. Soca parang. Okay, now I want to go to a group that, as I told you, they have a national parang, uh, parang competition in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, and I mentioned to you the three particular areas, uh, but this group, Los Alumnos de San Juan, uh, have performed and will actually perform quite regularly, and they have won, at least in 2009, that would, they had already won the competition like seven or eight times. So they're a very, very popular uh, group, and I want to play, this is for the group competitions. So I want to move on to our last section here, uh, which is our largest section, of course. But I want to mention that there are other paranda traditions, Panama, Grenada, and, uh, and possibly in other places as well. It's interesting. Today I had a conversation with James Lovell, and he mentioned to me that um, he, when I talked to him about the the uh, Paranda uh, workshop and everything, he said they have a similar thing uh, in which they represent or celebrate the different Paranda uh, uh, cel festivities and celebrations in the Caribbean in New York. So they have a program that they do as well, where they have people from Venezuela, other people who do par Paranda tradition as well. So let's move on now to Central America and Garifuna culture. So it's always interesting for me and very humbling when I'm talking to an audience when a good number of the people are Garifuna. So uh, please bear with me and, uh, and I hope I am doing some things correctly here. So we talk about, of course, this particular region here from Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua uh, as the central place uh, for the, the, originally we know the birth of the culture happens in St. Vincent and then with the, with the migration or the exile to Central America here uh, in the late 18, late uh, 1700s, 1797 or so. So let's talk about the profile here, and this is also for our video documentation. Now the Grifone, as we know, are a synthesis, synthesis of indigenous peoples of West Africa and uh, the Amerindians in, in the Eastern Caribbean. And we talk about this as the Carib and the Arawak, also known as Taino, as we know. Uh, now, they have a common sacred and secular system or body of rituals that are, that are done, similar beliefs and practices, and of course an Arawak and Carib based language and repertoire dance song genres. It's interesting, every time I go to, uh, to a particular place, and I've been fortunate enough to, uh, to spend a lot of time in Belize and been through Guatemala, La Buga, and also down to uh, Trujillo and to um, La Ceiba and to also on the island of Roatan. I learn a lot that I didn't know before. And uh, I'm always humbled at the amount of information that's out there and the various traditions that, that still exist that, that have not been done, that a lot of research has not been done on. So that's important to know. 
So when we think about the totality of the Garifuna, we need to think about the 300,000 or so that are in Central America. And we don't know an exact uh, population. We can only do an estimate. But we know the major countries. There are Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. We also know that there are many, of loca many locations outside of Central America. And we know primarily the largest population in New York, next here in Los Angeles, and also Chicago. Now, there's also sizable populations in uh, New Orleans, uh, uh, I think Miami, Washington. We have about 20 or so families in Atlanta. And there's also a community in Michigan, uh, near in most of the other major cities, you'll find at least uh, some number of Garifuna. Okay. Houston as well. Okay, Native American ancestry. So we need to think about the various uh, groups that make up the Native American ancestry, the Carib, the Arawak, uh, the Taino, and Igneri here. Now, when we think about the places that they came from, we have to think about why the Carib and the Arawak ended up in these uh, islands in the Caribbean. So let's take a look at the map here of South America. Now this is a Native American map here, and I like to show this to my students because it gets, gets, they get a chance to see where the group of people were originally. And many cases in the close Native uh, Americans who live in the Amazon region are still, of course, in this, in this particular area. So we have, uh, let me find my, okay, the Arawak and Carib here. And uh, the Arawak migrate through the left. to be hanged for a crime I have committed. Meaning, uh, if I did something wrong, then talk about me. But I don't deserve the gossip that you're having because I've done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's basically, the grandfathers and godfathers see this behavior, but they learned it from you. And now it hurts you to see them act this way. Okay? So let's listen to uh, and watch Junior Aranda singing Mingi Gili and Malate Isien. Listen to a portion of it, sorry.
Okay, so let's move to our last parandero. Oh, we actually have one more living one here. Mr. Asiatic is going to come for us. <laughs> and uh, uh, Paul Nabor, King of Paranda. And uh, Nabi, as he's often uh, affectionately known, and uh, known primarily there. And actually, he's the person that is known most globally uh, in the parandero um, throughout the world, and primarily for his song, Nuguyane. So, Alfonso Palacio, 1928, 2014, considered the, the greatest uh, paran, parandero of his time. Um, and I was talking to, did we ever find out anything about uh, birth? Uh, no. Not yet, okay. So there was a little discrepancy, but we think he's um, possibly born in La Buga. Uh, uh, and, um, and spending most of his time, his life there between La Buga and and PG in Punta Gorda. And one daughter, of course, here in, in, in LA, recorded 10 songs on the, uh, 10 songs recorded, and most of the most widely well known is uh, Nukuya Ne, of course. I toured internationally, and actually in 2008, when I had these, uh, the, the Grifana uh, Symposium in Atlanta, he came and he performed at that point in time. I don't know how old he was at that point. That's 2008, so it's six years before this period in time. So he was 80 at the time. And he traveled extensively a lot of times, of course, slowing down near the end. And he unfortunately died of a, of a stroke. Now, it is, it is, there was a big musical tribute, eight performers, major performers there uh, at the at the big sports arena uh, where they had a musical tribute to him before he died. A lot of dignitaries came. The Sir Corville Young and Aurelio flew in from Spain, where he was at the time, uh, to attend the, the, uh, the funeral and the interment services. The, the youth in the city, the, uh, the, the students, as well as tourists lined the street all the way uh, for the procession following the, uh, the, uh, the service. Okay. Now we listen to Nuguya Ne, uh, most of us know. And this was performed, I always wondered about the words on this, but I, once I read some things, this is actually performed when his sister was on her deathbed. Mm -hmm. And this is how, this is why the words are there. Brother, I am ill. Dear brother, I am ill. I have tossed and turned in my bed. With this ailment at, in the presence of my family, I have spoken with my children. Dear brother, when I pass away, I must have a band at my funeral. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's the little ones I'm worried about. It's my children that I'm worried about. It was interesting to me when I first went to Belize a number of years back to see after uh, 
that there would be musicians going down the street, and I found out someone had passed. I didn't know. I, I knew about this tradition in New Orleans. I didn't know about it among, in, in, among the Garifun. I, I didn't know uh, at that point in time, but this definitely exists. So Ronnie's going to uh, come forward now. We're going to listen to a little bit of the section here on Nuguyane, and he's going to talk to us. You want to do translation or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. He is more than an artist. Yeah, that's a lot of translating to do. <laughs> Uh, Paul Nabor is more than an artist. He plays, uh, as far as I remember, at the age of 15. He has been playing all, all of his life. He has written so many songs that uh, even up until today, at this day, uh, he might not even remember some of the songs. <laughs> he spent most of his time living in PG, Punta Gorda, um, attending his uh, temple, his Dabuyaba. And it never occurred to him that he one day was going to leave the area to go perform all over the world. Y lo que pasó fue todo un fenómeno, que fue que grabó el disco y inmediatamente eh, la canción Aguiané and it was like a phenomenon the moment he recorded the album and the song Nuguyane made it uh, on the charts of the world music. It was a total success. Okay, okay. I wanted him to give some of that. Uh, I want to uh, one thing I want to mention to you before we Oziadi comes up, and there's some things I was thinking about, but I won't go into all of the things, some things that are about my research, but I, the one thing I want to mention to you in reference to what Joe Palacio, and Joe Palacio, most of you may know him, uh, Grifina, very important, and the most uh, published uh, Grifina scholar, and he mentioned some things in an article that I was reading that he had about the what he considers these three components uh, of diasporic identity. So everyone who's Gadifan who lives outside of Central America is a part of the Gadifan diaspora. Okay, and uh, he says um, Palacio's three components: becoming uprooted, becoming different, and self-conscious connectivity refers to feelings associated with being a member of a diasporic people. All three are related to a person's feelings of physical displacement from one from his culture and his place of origin and feeling different or alien in the new environment of residence. The concept of self-consciousness, connectivity, uh, one's place of origin, traditionally accompanies feelings that many immigrants have of longing for their cultural, for what was culturally familiar. Because music is familiar orally and linguistically um, in how it sounds in the language, it is a marker of, of, of culture. That is how, it is that which is recognizably familiar. Therefore, it functions as a phenomenon that soothes the pains associated with being disconnected from your culture. Okay. All right.
Okay. Now, we want to talk a bit about our guest here. Um, thank you all for being so patient, and I had, uh, when I do presentations, I try to make sure that, uh, provide information, and thank you for, for that. We'll move into our last section now with Asiatic. And in this particular case, uh, I asked, uh, he sent me a bio, and I, did, and I knew he had accomplished a lot, uh, but I didn't know how all the specifics, a lot of the specifics, so I'm just going to go through some, some of the highlights that are on his, uh, on his bio that we have here. Uh, born in Hopkins, uh, and as you will find out, he is the nephew of Junior Aranda. Okay, uh, performing artist, producer, composer, and has done a lot as an entrepreneur to promote other artists, other uh, Garifuna artists and other artists here, and serves as a mentor to many of the younger musicians. 20 years as a professional performer, uh, beginning in 1996 with his, uh, his album, with the CD, Jam 96X. And uh, music and theater productions from his childhood. So this is his exposure and his, his ability to perform on stage and his comfort there uh, from that. And we, as many of you, some of you may know, are very much so influenced uh, by the work of Michael Jackson. His family moved to New York. Uh, we began and had a great deal of knowledge and learned a lot about the music industry, about the business, about studio recording and the business of that and background vocals. He's a choreographer, as well as a vocalist in the group uh, Kid Power, and that's where he met two very important people here, Barry Faceman from Fame and Paula Abdul. Performed with Andy Palacio and Paul Nabor and a number of different artists, and what I did not know until recent years is how, many, how much producing he's done uh, for shows here in LA and other places and other and artists as well. So. Uh, we can see some of the recordings uh, that he has, some noted CDs, and there are 11 solo albums that he's produced and produced a lot that he's had and produced a number of other artists. So let's welcome up to, is, and this is Asiatic, Vince Lewis. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and these are some scenes of... Uh, Hopkins, can you, where's your house? You have your right around here. <laughs> <laughs> right there? Is that the police station? Right, there? right. That's the police station. This is how you get in. Right? You get in the first thing you can see right here. That, yeah. That's the culvert. What do you call it? Like, no, vat. A vat. Yeah, that's where they used to collect water. When, back when, we, when I was young, we didn't have water, like running water. So that's where the, that was the village. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, Water. Yeah, that captain water. Yeah, captain. Is that where? Is it the same area that they used to have the phone? Because many of the times there was one phone booth in the state. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's where the police the station, station is. is the we didn't have police stations back then. Yeah, they, <laughs> you didn't need them, I guess. You yeah, we, we still don't need it, but they, I guess the government decided to put one there. We only have one policeman system. He doesn't do anything but chill. He doesn't do anything. <laughs> um, but that building was there when they had the hurricane when I was a kid. I think it was. I think. And I remember being looking through this window, right here, and seeing the outfall and I told them, and I said something, they always clown me about it. <laughs> yeah, that was there. Right. That was my village, yeah. That's kind of in front of my house. Oh, wow. This is, it's interesting, the Hopkins is a place people go to cool out from Dangriga, if you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. When Dangriga gets busy, they go to Hopkins and to cool out. Yeah. <laughs> And another thing. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a picture I took the last time. Oh, you took this? I took this one. Oh, wow. I was in Hopkins the other day, we were hanging out, having breakfast, just having a good time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I want to play something that I want him to talk a little bit about. <clears throat> it's not, it's not, it's not bland, it's not empty. I mean, my feeling comes out when I sing. Yeah. So when you hear songs like, it's Sunday, good day. I 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that particular song? Oh, man. Um, well, this song actually was um, written by this lady in New York. And um, I, was, I recorded it in New York. I was, I was recording an album called The Finale. And um, she was referred to me by a friend of mine. He was like, man, I think you do pretty good with this song. So I went ahead and recorded it because I actually liked the message in it. It pretty much talked something about... Um, it's saying that the sound you hear to like sickness that is like, I guess people are saying like sickness that's like the worst or like the, the worst sickness ever is like not being able to see, you know, like sound you uh, like marihin, marihin, marihin. Like if you're not able to see, it's like like probably one of the worst things ever, you know, to go go through in life. But but that's at least that's based on this song. I'm sure there's worse things than that. Good. So we're going to do a quick uh, some interview uh, questions. I have some questions I talked. I want to talk to him about. So um, how did you? Um, let's see. Here we go. How did you get the name Asiatic? Man, I wish I knew you got like something exciting, but <laughs> I just made it up. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I I was trying to find a name that that sets me apart from everybody else. Uh-huh. And I, I was trying to find something I've never heard in my life, something that would, when someone say, they can say, you know what, or if you ever hear it, you know it would just be about me. Like nah. nobody else had that name. Okay. But I, I think there is someone else now, so. Cool, yeah, there's Maybe one of us. There's two of you. Now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell us about your life and growing up in Hopkins. I'm, I'm sure you experienced a culture shock when you moved to LA. Tell us about how that affected you, and especially going from an environment where you were surrounded by culture to one on a daily basis, even when you ran outside, to, to coming to, to LA where you had where there were different activities but not as many. Yeah. Um, well growing up in Hopkins, um, I grew up at a time when we didn't we didn't have any electricity. Mm-hmm. We didn't have any running um, shocking when I moved out here from there because again, I remember the first time I saw a light bulb. You know, I remember the, like the in my village we didn't have um, light as you know at, at one point, but at some point they decided to put electricity. And my house had actually had a, a lamp post right in front of it, so we actually had a light on ours because they were like every other lights on every other lamp post. And the one in front of my house we had a light. And I remember like around like when it would get dark, whatever time that was, from five thirty, whatever time that was, like we'd all be outside waiting for the lights to come on. <laughs> And when the light came on, we start clapping like it was like the biggest thing, you know. But I remember that. I remember um, we need, like I said, we have running water. So I mean, uh, going to the well and mm-hmm. getting water in the morning. That, those were my chores. You know, I had to uh, get water from the well. I had to um, rake the yard, like right. things like that. I and mean, if I didn't do it, trust me, my dad he didn't play. Um, but it was fun, and you know, it, I mean, the thing about it is that again, you can't miss what you don't know. And growing up in that environment, like it was like the best to me. I mean, we had a good time, and I didn't know anything about stuff out here. And like I said, I remember the first time I saw a television. We had a radio, and I actually thought there were two people in the radio. I thought there was a man and a woman who could change their voices. <laughs> so, and sometimes the radio would break, and my dad would open it, and I would try to find this, these, these people. And I used to think like I would just run and hide when, because <laughs> I would look throughout the radio trying to find these people in the radio. But I mean, it was cool. But yeah, it was definitely a shell shock. I remember the first time I, moved, I came to America. It was on a vacation. And I went to a, there was a grocery store called The Boys, I think. Mm-hmm. And I remember I walked in, the door opened. And I ran, and I ran away, like, because I got scared. I didn't know who opened the door. So I thought it was, you know, where I come from, we also we used to think about ghosts right. and stuff like that. So. Right, right. <laughs> so things like that was, you know, it was cool. But now thinking back about it, it was just, it's just pretty funny. So yeah. it, was, it was cool. So what were your first memories of hearing Paranda in Belize? I mean, again, in my village, what we had for entertainment was 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 drums, mm-hmm. and initially when I first heard Peron, it was always just drummers and the women or men who were singing. Mm-hmm. It wasn't really like one singer. I didn't mm-hmm. know what a solo artist was. We didn't have such things. Uh-huh. Maybe there were. I don't know. I didn't know about it. Right. But during like um, I remember like around Christmas time, my uncle would come over. My uncle Junior Aranda, that's my dad's brother. So his name is Aranda, but he's really a Lewis. But he got his mom's last name. 
<laughs> that's their business. I don't know nothing about it. <laughs> but um, so a lot of people don't know he's my uncle, but yet yeah, that's my dad's brother. So on, on Christmas, on, during like Christmas time, he would come to my house and with his guitar, and he ever he went, he went with his, his guitar. Yeah. Um, and he would he would sit on the porch and sing songs and literally make up songs on the spot. These guys, from what I understand, they didn't even write songs. Like they would just like create a song right then and there, and it was always based on something happening. Right. So how he remembered it, I don't know because again he would, he would he'd sit here right now and make up a song about somebody, but he'll sing it again tomorrow and then a week after or whatever, and he would just remember him. So I used to sit there and stare at him forever. Like I was always like like fascinated by it. And I think, and when I really think about it, I believe he was my first like, like person I looked at as an, like who I idolized. Even though at the time I didn't know that was such a thing as being, as idolizing somebody, I didn't know what that word was growing up. So, but now when I think about it, I think I was idolizing him because I used to watch him and I used to always want to be like him and, and sing, you know, because I've always, always like singing. I didn't know I could sing, I used to sing. Like, I would just open my mouth and sing and follow him. And I, and I remember he used to make up songs even like, um, I remember a couple songs he made up in my house. I don't remember the name of them, but I remember like if I hear it, like some songs he, he made up, mm -hmm. like just by sitting on my porch, like on the veranda, we'd be drinking um, the same thing he was talking about, the, the so eggnog. Eggnog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my mom used to make that stuff. Yeah, you know, so he used to just sit there watching me sit him all day. Uh, so who would you put on your list of the top three or four uh, most influential paraneros? Um, and why? To me or just in general? To you. <laughs> or? Well, well, I mean, I would say my, my uncle would be the first, only because, again, he was, he was, he was the one I knew closely, mm -hmm. you know? And as I grew up and started learning about other singers, I would definitely say um, Paul Nabor. Okay. Uh, him and I, you know, because I, I, once I got to meet him, I used to hang out at his house in PG, you know, mm -hmm. by, by the, by the, 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 the Weeba. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to go there, I would sit with him like for hours and just talk. Like he'd, he'd have like crazy stories. And him and I would just have conversations for like hours and hours and hours. And he'd always drink his hot Guinness because he has okay. to have his hot Guinness. So we would sit there and just converse, you know, converse, just uh, converse all day. Anybody else? Um, Andy Palacio. And Palacio, okay. Yeah, um, again, a very close friend of mine, and he, mm -hmm. he he taught me a lot, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. just having talks. We just talk. We just talk all day. All these guys, we all we do is just talk. We'd be in a room, hotel rooms talking. We'd be driving, mm -hmm. talking. And yeah. So, of course, you know, he influenced me a lot, um, taught me a lot, and... I look up for him. I look up to him. Okay. Uh, let's see. You mentioned that. Okay. When and how did you become a professional musician? I never thought. I, I never knew I was a professional. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, well, I mean, I would say the first time I did a, a record was the Jam '96. Mm -hmm. It was actually something I was recording, not really to, to release. At the time, I was living at this house in Studio City, and we had a full. Full, like professional studio. Oh wow! And this uh, big producer who produced like Pointer Sisters and Patti LaBelle, all these people, and he 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 put me in charge of the studio. So I had to take, maintain the studio. So at night, I mean, they were like night owls. So we'd be up all night. So one day he'd go to his spells where he wouldn't come down from his house upstairs. I mean, it was a mansion, so he used to be upstairs, and I had the down floor, the, 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 the bottom floor. I wouldn't see him for days. So I'd get bored, and I didn't have a car. So I couldn't leave. I mean, up on a hill somewhere, oh. I couldn't go to LA, hang out with my cousins and my friends, so I get bored. So I started messing around in the studio. So I started oh. recording beats, like, and that's how I started recording Jam 96. It was really just me just play, messing around. So I would let my mom hear it. So my mom was like, man, this sounds really good. You should release it. And I'm like, release what? She's like, you should release these songs. And that's how I came out with Jam 96, because I was just recording songs just, to have, just because I was bored and I was just having fun. Wow. And I guess she said, she told me she liked it, so I figured maybe if she liked it, other people might like it, so Thank I just put it out. Good. She didn't lie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When did you start producing other artists and Garifuna events? Well, I started producing concerts. I was actually, well, actually I started in high school, mm -hmm. like doing um, um, like shows in high school um, for, for um What's it, what do you call them in high school? Assemblies. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I invited, um, I think they were having cultural, it was a week or day, something like that, but I used to go to um, Hamilton High School. 
and it's for the performing arts. Okay. So they would have like um, cultural, I think day. Mm -hmm. So I went to um to one, of the, to, to one of the music teachers I knew, and I asked them if it was okay for me to invite a, mm. a punta rock or band to come to the to the to the school. Okay. And he was like, "Well, you gotta." You know, they gave me a run around at first, mm -hmm. of course, but I I was determined. So I went ahead and I spoke to the principal. I spoke to all these other people, and mm -hmm. finally said, "Okay, if you do it, this is all going to be on you." <laughs> I said, oh, "Okay, like, well, I don't know what that meant, but I'll do it." So I called Bobbin Warriors. And that's why I call Bobbin Warriors with Jess Flores. Oh, wow, oh, okay. And um, I told him, hey, I want you guys to come down here and do a show. But the, what we had set up was it would be a show every hour for all, what, seven periods, I believe? How many periods in high school? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, six or seven, six or seven. Okay. Right. All, 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 all periods. So we had to set up a show for all those things. And I had to set up all the sound. And, and my school at that time, like I said, is for performing arts. So it's oh. the sound and, and the lighting is... Like it's really out good. here, yeah. like it's like a real, real concert, right? right? So, but I had to hire the guy, get the money to hire the, the guy to do this lighting and the sound and everything. And I put, I don't know how I did it, but I did it. And I invited the guys over, and I went to talk to the teachers to bring their class to the auditorium during those periods. Okay. And it was a huge success. I mean, it was it was amazing. And and I, and I got the bug, and I was like, man, I could do this. But I never thought about doing it in the girl from the community. I just felt uh, like I could do this, like. I could I could do the next Michael Jackson concert for him if he wanted me to. Right. That's how big my hair got, right? <laughs> so I think what got me into uh. doing it for in the girl from the community was I went to do a show. And I think it was La Booga involved with a show at at um at at, at one of Prince Hall. Okay. And I walked in and I was like looking at the crowd. I said I saw looking. I said I think I could do this, you know. I went home and I talked to my cousin and talked to him about doing it. Anyway, mm -hmm. the point is I talked to him into doing it and mm -hmm. then I called Labu and I told him he wanted him to be a part of it. the first big concert I did, which was I brought this band Punta Rebels out here. Oh, okay. And um and the rest was history. From then on we just build on it. Wow. Do you know how many about how many shows you produce? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I I, okay. I, I I lost track. Okay. All right. So we're gonna listen to your uncle. Uh, do a song and then we want to talk to you about your version of this song. Oh, okay? cool. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk to a little bit about Louis Ba Masinu? Uh, Let's play it and then we'll do it. We'll talk about it at the end. Okay. What translation you can tell them yeah. what it's about. talk about um well I, I, I mean what you guys heard right now were two different versions of the same song again the first version was my uncle and uh, the second one was a recording I did just recently from my from my upcoming um Piranha project um again I mean the song just talks about how basically saying that if it's kind of speaking about a community if you've been if, if, if someone is doing something in the community where the community then like kind of shuns you or like pushes you away, so basically, basically what he's saying like if you can't even be accepted in your own culture, in your own community, then where else are you going to be able to live or where else can you, can you rule or you know, be, a, be a king or a queen, basically. So, so again, it's like what um, the doctor has said earlier. The songs that, most Burnish songs pretty much are talking about Situation that people are are, are, are are going through, or something like something that's happening that pe people just talk about. I mean, again, you just write about what you see or what I, what you what you what you're seeing around you, and it's also lessons. You know, I guess 
to, to try to show you the best way to go to, to, to live your life, you know? And we just put it in song. I mean, it's, it's, it's more like we're trying to do whatever we can to try to educate the culture so that everybody can live a, an honest and righteous life, I guess. When you take a song like that, uh, what's your, is there a particular process you go through like to make it to make, modernize it or to make it more accessible to youth now? I mean, is there uh, how you how you inspired to to do that? Do you what, what do you do with you change the drumming pattern? Do you I know you speed the tempo up, but is there a way you go about through it, or is it one from one song to the next? I mean, the process is is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. I think what changes is just the. The, the, the mood you're in at the moment, okay. the the feel that I'm, I'm in that moment. How, how am I feeling that moment it determines the, the the music that surrounds that song. Okay. The drum pattern again, it cre it's, it's pretty much same um, stays the same because the only thing we're trying to do is recreate what that's doing mm -hmm. with the drum pattern in the uh, like a drum machine. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? The, the song, the, well, as long as you could try to. We try to recreate that, but then it's, then build around it so that it can then be something more um, mm -hmm. acceptable by the younger people in terms of like okay. the, the the instrumentation, right? But, you know, but also what you're feeling, you know. I mean, because it it, 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 could, it could it could go either way. I mean, right. I might I might create something different for the song, and you might create something, something else different, different. But it's right. all about what you hear. Hear what you're hearing. But then <laughs> it all comes mm -hmm. out about who you know. Okay whatever it is that you come up with. I have two last questions here. First is, uh, although punta and punta rock are the styles of Garifuna music that move the hips, paranda moves the heart. Paranda songs are proverbial in that they contain proverbs and lessons about how one should live or should not live, how one should act or should not act. What are your thoughts about this? Uh, can you recall any personal experiences that about Paranda songs that have messages or themes that related to things that have maybe been going on in your life? I mean, I do agree Punta Rock will make you sh shake. <laughs> <laughs> Am I lying? <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's, it's hypnotizing. Um, Paranda music, again, is, that's that. That's definitely is a good way to explain it. Like it is. It's like the soul. It's from the soul. Um, best way to explain it again is almost like when you have like a pop song or like a techno song. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not gonna be really saying "I love you, baby." So like, <laughs> you can, but it's not gonna be as effective as if you slow it down to like a ballad. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Ballads. You put a ballad on, and people you, that emotion can come out. And especially when you're trying to. Um, create melodies and vocal styles, it's much more pleasing to the ear and much more emotional when you when it's when it's slow. Yeah. Yeah. So Paranda is the same way. Okay. You know, so then if you're telling a story, you can tell that story. You can and now you can actually fit more words into a Paranda to really get your point across because the the tempo, tempo is slower. Is slower. Now, if you go faster I mean, you can do it because right. it won't be as effective in terms of emotion. Okay. And sometimes when you're trying to tell a story, emotion is important. You have to have that emotion. If the emotion isn't there, it's, it, sometimes the message gets lost. So I think Paranda, that's where Paranda kind of separates from Punta in terms of... Yeah, so you've, you've, you've recorded, you've transformed several Paranda songs. Are, there, are those the ones that like speak to you more? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, are there certain well, things about a given song that... Did the you song, decide? The song that 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 that, that comes to mind when you, when you ask this question is um, the song you shared earlier, uh, Malate. Malate. Uh -huh. Because I mean, when I was younger, I used to find myself trying to please people, uh, and I think uh, I mean I ain't gonna say a lot of people do that, but but uh, you know there are people out there who do that. We try to please people by, and you know like sometimes people act a certain way towards you, and then you want to uh, now do things for them or. Right. Or when you go out, you know, you want to pay for things for them, and you know, right. you tend to want to do that because you're trying to win over their, 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 right. their, their, their love or something. I don't know. But then at the end of the day, you start realizing they're only going to be nice to you at that moment because they're getting something, something from, from you. It. Right. But then guess what? They really don't like you. Right. <laughs> they read them because, and then so, so then when that song says that, that and we, it was a song because I think I had asked my mom one time to kind of translate for me. Um, and when she explained it to me, I was like, wow, you know, because I found myself doing that. I found myself trying to get people who, didn't, who I knew didn't like me to like me. Wow. 
yeah. you know? Yeah. That's, so we all, I'm like, man, whatever, <laughs> you know? <laughs> We've all done yeah, like me, it's all good, you know? It's really, really powerful when it comes to that. And I think a lot of people can relate to it. At some point in their life, I'm sure someone has probably been in that situation, you know? Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really important what you just said, and I think it's, that's one of the things that's universal about the message in a lot of the parandas. Mm -hmm. It's very, very universal. Um, I'm going to play uh, his version while he's getting set up to do your other thing. Oh, sure. And uh, of Malate Yisian, but I, for one thing I want to say, and this is just as a person, yes. Can I say something? Yes. Yes. Come on. <laughs> Uh, let me say one thing here. To me, uh, Paranda, as an African American, I'm not Garifuna, and I've uh, people have said it, uh, have questioned. So I said, no, I'm not. I'm not Belizean either. But uh, I just <laughs> fell in love with the culture and fell in love with the, the music and the things that I've learned a lot about why I can call myself an African American as an African American as a result of my experiences with the Garifuna people because a lot of practices that they've been able to maintain in cultural things were taken and were not allowed for, for African Americans to express here. Mm. You know, I'm from the South, and so I have an, a, a big affinity with Garifuna culture. I tell people that it's my, my father's side of the family. My father had there were 15 of them growing up, so I said, that's my Garifuna side. <laughs> <laughs> Because there's so many, <laughs> so many of them. Uh, but let me say this one thing: is I said to me, Paranda is Garifuna blues. It is a genre of music that allows Garifuna men to express their challenges in life, their pains, their disappointments, their desires, lost, loss of loved ones, uh, their mortality, their joys, and so on. For that reason, it seems to me to be the soul or the essence of the humanity of Garifuna man and Garifuna people as a whole. So, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Junior Alvarez. I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York City. But families from Honduras, Guatemala, and Belize. Um, I'm an upcoming artist, as well as a punta rock artist that goes by the name of Good Children. Um, I just want to give a little story, real quick, you know, before we actually, you know, continue the program. But um, um, as a kid growing up, you know, being around, you know, the Garifuna family and stuff like that, you know, as a little kid, you know, you're just growing up and you're just like wondering what's going on, right? So, yeah, just growing up, just listening to punta music and paranda music, and as a little kid, I'm just like, what is this, you know what I'm saying? Like, nobody actually really took the time to really explain what kind of music, you know, I'm surrounded by, you know, my parents, mom and dad, you know, because growing up as a kid, seeing your parents having fun and doing this and stuff like that, you just like, oh, okay, <laughs> right? You're like, okay, nice, nice. But um, I remember one day, um, my father, because my father's also a musician too, one of the original members of this New York band called East Paris of Old, mm -hmm. one of the popular bands. Um, yeah, and also Girls and the Kids too, in the beginning, but then, you know. But anyway, my father would have this cassette. <laughs> it's funny, this cassette, right? This cassette happens to be Jet 96 by Asiatic. <laughs> so, I think, yeah, the first song was um, Chick the Bug. That's the song. So, you know, the cassette, like the tape player and stuff like that, you gotta press play, you gotta stop and rewind and stuff like that. So, you know, my father would just, you know, put in the Jam 96 tape and actually rewind it because, you know, the record would be in the middle already, you know, these big things and stuff like that. But anyway, as soon as this song comes in, da -da 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 -da, right, the music is playing in the living room. I will be somewhere in the house, like, maybe in my bedroom playing a video game, but as soon as I hear that song, I will actually run out of the bed and go straight into the living room. <laughs> go like this, like, oh. And I remember I went in front of my father, and I'm like, Dad, what's that? And he finally said, this is Punta. 
saying? It's that like even before that record came out, like I didn't really like Boom Up, but until that record came out, that's what really inspired me to even do what I'm doing right now as we speak. And this guy right here is my favorite artist. So make some noise for Asia. <laughs> And it's an honor to be Thank able you, to be this close to this government, but Asiatic is the reason why I'm doing Punta music, man. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, great, uh, great story. So we're going to call the musicians to come over, please, and we're going to get ready for a show.
The Garifuna Palanda likely evolved uh, when the Garifuna arrived in Central America. On mainland Honduras, uh, the Garifuna interacted with the Spanish culture that already existed there. We have to keep in mind that on the island of Roatan, this Roatan was really an English colony, so it would have been when the Garifuna went to mainland Honduras that that is where they encountered the Spanish culture and the parranda. So when we talk about the introduction of the guitar, this occurred when they, of course, when they were in Central America and they interacted with the Europeans there. Now Dan Rosenberg, uh, in his liner notes from Paranda, uh, Africa and Central America, confirms that the Paranda actually entered the repertoire of the Garifuna traditional music in the 19th century, after the Garifuna arrived in Honduras. So let's think about this. So what happens to the culture? So they arrived in Honduras in 1797. And within five years of that, by 1802, the Griffin had begun to migrate from Central America into uh, Belize and Guatemala. So you cannot have a whole entire repertoire of music like all of Paranda to exist and to have the entire repertoire of songs exist only in a five year period of time. So what does this mean? So the, the repertoire existed or the whole body of music over a period of time. Because you have to remember this, Garifuna have the same language. They live in Belize, Guatemala, Honduras. So a person who has a brother or sister in Belize might also have a, a sibling or uh, from, from Belize might have a sibling in Honduras or in Guatemala or close relatives. And so therefore they go back and forth between the countries because of the easy access and because of the language. And as they move, they travel, they take their songs with them. So that is, that is one way over the period of time that Paranda began to spread throughout this particular region. So a lot of the older Garifuna say that Paranda was originally done during Christmas and at that point in time. So that was when you had the majority of Paranda sung. But it is often done now year round because many of the words are not specifically about Christmas. None of them really are. So they're really social commentary song forms uh, that are composed by men and express their aspects of their interpretation of, of, of culture and society. Now by the time they arrived in Central America, the Paranda had already been there. And this is interesting because the Spanish had set up colonies, uh, established settlements in a lot of the places. For example, we talked earlier about Venezuela. So the Sp first Spanish settlement in Venezuela was in 1522, and in Puerto Rico in 1508, and in Honduras in 1524. So all of this, if you think about it, the Griffin arrived in uh, St. Vincent, or the culture evolved in St. Vincent in 1635. So if we keep that in mind, it is, that is a whole century and a decade or two after you have the arrival of the Spanish settling, uh, establishing settlements in Venezuela, in Honduras, and in Puerto Rico. So uh, when the Griffin arrived in this area, the Paranda already existed as it, as it is. But they made, their, they made the Paranda their own, added their own music, uh, added their own language, of course, and interpretations and songs based on their own practices. Now, uh, although the only requirement to, to accompany the voice is the guitar, the use of drums, occasional hand percussion instruments, was found in Puerto Rico, in Venezuela, and Trinidad. They support the existence of a Spanish, that this was a Spanish-derived cult practice in the region. Okay, now let's go into Juni, Juni Aranda. Simon Juni, Juni, or Junior Aranda. He's born in uh, Hopkins, Belize, uh, and his, this is a hometown of Asiatic, who we'll hear from a little bit later. But he lived much of his life in Dangriga. He has seven children, and he was born in 1939 and died in 2011. He was known to carry his gu guitar around with him wherever he went. And he was a featured vocalist in three of the songs on the Paranda CD, Africa and Central America. 
he received his first guitar at the age of 15 and unfortunately it was destroyed in Hurricane Hattie as well as his uncle passed uh, died in Hurricane Hattie this is the uncle that taught him uh, how to play paranda he sang Oftentimes, Junior Aranda sang about the devastation of Hurricane Hattie when he would do shows and when he would play for people. Uh, he claimed the Paranda songs were ways of actually getting back at people in the culture. Uh, he said, when someone does bad things to you, you don't start fights. Uh, you get back at them in song. He stated that he has written songs about people in Dangriga uh, who, have, who owe him money, former girlfriends, or former employers. So really, it's a form of social uh, commentary and social control, the songs are. So people in town would, would soon learn about anyone who had crossed him or done him wrong because he'd write a song about it. He had quite a sense of humor as evident in the song Mingigili, which is really all about unconditional love. And when unconditional love is no longer unconditional. So, Junior Aranda passed, uh, unfortunately, in, on March the 14th, 2011. And this was the 216th anniversary of the death of Joseph Chatouillet, who was the paramount chief of the Griffina on St. Vincent. And he died in, in, in uh, 1796. Uh, Junior Aranda was given a state's funeral in, in Dangriga. 